آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما uh, uh, Today we are speaking about uh, subdural hematoma and uh, specifically uh, chronic uh, type of the uh, subdural hematoma and um, most of you, uh, of you uh, know this subject, it's easy, isn't it? Um, well, uh, it's easy if we uh, applied it, uh, all the, uh, uh, our knowledge correctly, but it's not unusual that we see real complication with, with uh, such an, um, a straightforward, I can call very common neurosurgical um, uh, procedure. Uh, why? We will know that uh, in a minute. The other uh, procedure that I really uh, get sad uh, to see a lot of complication, the same as with the chronic sub subdural hematoma, are external ventricular drains and uh, shunt. And all of this because we are not applying proper knowledge. So how can we break uh, this of uh, negligence? I think you are applying it uh, very properly uh, where you are acquiring the knowledge, reading, uh, listening, uh, attending uh, such uh, uh, um, distance. Uh, uh, knowledge uh, application uh, programs as well as in the hospital. Hopefully, we will have uh, the uh, an excellent neurosurgical um, uh, generations starting from you. So, um, let me ask the uh, junior who have joined um, uh, who did not yet attended or performed. Uh, his first case of chronic subdural hematoma. So uh, this is a real uh, common uh, procedure, but we have to step back um, uh, for a few minutes in the coming um, uh, time and just think about it from the uh, systematic point of view. So when we say uh, subdural hematoma, what do we uh, really uh, mean? Uh, we mean simply collection of blood or uh, bloodish like um, uh, uh, fluid uh, in the uh, subdural space, and we will come to this terminology uh, about the truth or myth uh, regarding this. But in general, the subdural uh, hematoma uh, can be either unilateral or can be bilateral. It can be in the acute stage presenting in the chronic stage or uh, something and we call it acute on top of uh, chronic and this is how the uh, process uh, progress and, and uh, increases with uh, time. Now um, the uh, traumatic subdural hematoma uh, uh, most of the time is not a per se um, uh, presentation but it is in a group of um, uh, finding uh, mostly associated with intracerebral um, uh, laceration confusion, and then the subdural will be a part of it, maybe an associated subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's in the uh, um, accompanying of uh, brain edema, and it is not the main issue for the management, but most of the time uh, it is a by finding, but most of the other findings are the need for the uh, 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 immediate uh, action by the uh, neurosurgeon. Now, um, all of you uh, or most of you have seen an epidural hematoma and a subdural hematoma, and uh, um, uh, simply we always, always differentiate between the subdural that is follows the continuity of the brain while the, by the lens shape or lenticular shape uh, structure uh, um, we will think about the epidural hematoma the venous um, uh, ooze and 
a uh, arterial or arterial uh, uh, active uh, bleeding in in term of uh, management. So we have to really differentiate between the epidural and subdural. Now, I uh, borrowed this case from Dr. Hamza uh, uh, Abdara and Dr. Uh, uh, Faiz Al-Aliyan uh, to present it to you. So who can volunteer, yeah, Dr. Ahmed, uh, to describe and say what is this uh, case representing and what are the findings first? Okay, so uh, we need someone from the junior uh, to raise hand and it's a discussion with the group. So this is an, an, uh, an uh, CT scan, lung contrast uh, axial uh, cut uh, showing an uh, uh, left side uh, uh, hyperdense uh, uh, in the CT uh, going more with uh, epidural uh, hematoma with right side uh, multiple uh, bone fracture and a small uh, area of uh, uh, a small area of subdural uh, hematoma. Right side, just the kinetic door, well, the The fracture here in this side, yeah, and the uh, epidural in the other side. Mm, right. So there, there, there is a, um, a discontinuity, let's say, of the of the bone. Excellent. So there is a discontinuity uh, uh, here. But let's come back to the, um, um, the main uh, finding that we would like to discuss. So you said this is, uh, goes more with an epidural. Why did you say that? Uh, the, the, shape, the shape of bleed is go more with epidural. Uh, mm. So you mean it is uh, it has a con concavity toward the brain and it's not the convexity that is following the cortex uh, of the hemisphere, isn't it? That's correct. Yeah. So this is what we would like to um, to watch because the, this case was uh, managed from A to Z by uh, uh, Dr. Hamza with Dr. Faiz Al Aliyani, um, which is a 71 year old. Uh, you, you are correct, Dr. Ahmed. He has bone discontinuity because he he had few years ago uh, trauma. And again, an epidural hematoma, which was evacuated at that, at that time. And now he presented with decreased level of contrast, with uh, a seizure, and, and a CT scan was performed. Now, to our surprise, this is not an epidural hematoma. They made a small quartz, they made a small craniotomy, and they opened the dura because they did not find any hematoma overlying the dura, so it is not by terminology a subdural, um, uh, it is not an epidural, and then they opened the dura and found this hematoma. Actually, this is one of the rare uh, entity that is called encapsulated subdural uh, uh, hematoma that can be in the acute uh, stage and can go to the uh, chronicity. Now, when we go uh, back to our image, we find that there are some uh, characteristics, like in this MRI, you see the lens shape is not smooth with the, uh, with the, um, with the cortex. There is like a dural tail, like we talk in the meningioma, like a dural tail. Of course, this is all retrospective. Uh, I did not know this when I saw it in the beginning until I said, but the bottom line is that you have to anticipate uh, all the scenarios when we uh, uh, open. Yes, most of the time, this shape is an epidural, but you have also to anticipate, go read at your knowledge so that you can know uh, uh, about other diseases that you did not um, uh, know before. Now, as we said, most of the acute uh, subdural hematomas are uh, uh, traumatic in origin. But uh, when we talk about the chronic, which is the topic of our uh, 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 interaction tonight, um, we find that most of these are non-traumatic and they originate from the inner dural 
uh, plexus. Anyone knows what is inner neural plexus? So we will know now. The other question is, um, is it really a subdural? When we say subdural, is it space or it's otherwise? We will talk about it now. Now the uh, the tachy uh, uh, meanings are well known in the beginning to be a very tough um, uh, layer or sheet that surrounds the uh, the brain. But with time, with knowledge, with uh, anatomic and histological uh, studies, we uh, came to know more knowledge about the dura. It's not only a tough layer that covers uh, the uh, the brain, and it is an active uh, membrane. It is composed of fibroblasts and lots of collagen fibrils. How many layers? Most know that the dura has two layers, but actually, when we look closer and when we um, uh, carefully study the dura, we find that it has the periosteum, and that is the part uh, which is adherent to the skull and we have the meningeal layer and that is the part which is toward the uh, cortex or thia uh, or the subarachnoid space uh, but in between these uh, two layers the subarachnoid and the dura we have what is called the border cell uh, layer and this is an interface it's a layer that is very thin very gentle it is very vascularized, so it is a plexus of, uh, of vessels that is present just adjacent uh, and without any space between them and the, uh, the, uh, the subarachnoid uh, barrier, which will continue to have the arachnoid trabeculae and the arachnoid cells. So this is our uh, interest tonight, the border, uh, uh, cell uh, zone, which is the innermost part of the dura. So the periosteal, the meningeal, but now, now we have also what is known as the border cell layer that is very thin. Now, I utilize this information uh, uh, since the beginning, maybe uh, 20 or uh, 18 years ago, when uh, I knew that it is uh, of two layers without knowing the uh, inner uh, border cell layer. Why? Because it's very important to think that the dura layers are dissectable and they are easily dissectable if done properly because we utilize it, especially when we apply Calbase uh, procedure instead of bringing um, artificial or we need to utilize um, a periosteal uh, layer, maybe we don't find it, or a, or a fascia, then you can split the dura at the site of your craniotomy and use it as a graft at, at the end. So this is a very good technique that I uh, distribute. Now, let's go back to the types of uh, the um, uh, subdural hematoma. We said it can be traumatic, but sometimes, um, we don't have any history of trauma, or the patient or the family starting remembering, oh, maybe he, uh, um, our father or his, uh, their relative has hit the door while walking, or maybe uh, hit the uh, uh, window while looking out uh, of the car, and so forth. But we don't have uh, for sure um, a uh, explanation for the presence of this chronic subdural uh, hematoma or collection. And it, uh, now we know that it's not only trauma, but we do have inflammatory cells in this layer of the border cell zone, neural border cell zone. So once you have inflammation, you have tearing of this layer and make it very vascular, so new membrane will start form with this uh, inflammation and the pro-collagen. Now we have the angiogenic factors that promote the formation of fragile capillaries and thus the formation of this extra fragile abnormal 
uh, capillaries will add to the leakage of blood and more leakage will lead to more separation of this dural cell layer leading to the formation of um, uh, subdural hematoma. So now we have the knowledge of blood. It's not only two layer, but it's three layer, layer. And when we talk about chronic subdural hematoma, we are very interested in the um, uh, what we call the uh, dural cell zone or the innermost part of the dura. It is a very active vascular. It can accumulate an abnormal uh, and form an abnormal inflammatory uh, capillary network that is very weak uh, uh, and it can bleed and re-bleed with this inflammation. So with this information, we need to know how do we manage. Now we have trauma and we have non-somatic um, uh, uh, pathology or pathophysiology for the underlying uh, chronic subdural connection. Now, before we start with this, we need to classify so that as we did, if you remember two weeks ago, we talked about classification and grading of subarachnoid hemorrhage, whether on radiology or uh, clinically, like Hunt and Hiss or WFNS and Fisher classification. Now here also, we need to have some classification or grading, whether clinically or a, um, a grading system that depends also on the radiological uh, input. Why do we need this? As we will see later, these will act, number one, as a, a homogeneous communication between you, your colleague. If you have a case, you want to refer it to another uh, uh, hospital, or if you have uh, uh, somebody who would like also to um, uh, transfer a case to your uh, hospital. So we have a common uh, uh, nomenclature to you. Uh, moreover, when you are following the, these cases, at the end, we want to see the probability of this case to recur again. So we have something called recurrence in the, sub, uh, in the chronic subdural hematoma, and it's a major uh, uh, issue that we will talk uh, about later. So this includes also observation. So. Um, uh, observing the um, uh, patient, uh, following uh, the patient up, in some cases uh, who do not need immediate interfere is a major uh, establishment. So don't forget that observation is a very valid uh, option, including chronic subdural hematoma. When we talk about medical uh, therapy, yes, interest uh, uh, started since the 80s. Uh, for the chronic subdural hematoma. So we found um, many uh, articles and researches, whether only solo management for the, sub, uh, uh, the, the chronic subdural hematoma or as an adjuvant uh, uh, therapy in a trial to prevent the recurrence rate or to decrease the recurrence rate for these uh, uh, at risk or in treating those cases who have been treated before by another way, and now they, uh, uh, they had recurrence, so they can treat it by the medical therapy. So what are the um, medical uh, or the uh, medications that have been used? Well, the well-known is the uh, corticosteroid, whether the dexamethasone or the prednisolone, we have the atorvastatin that is used as an anticholesterol, uh, anti pranexamic acid that is a uh, uh, fibrinolytic and antifibrinolytic agent, and other agents that you cannot you cannot have an explanation to that use. Uh, Atizolam uh, is uh, something like uh, uh, benzodiazepine, uh, which is for anxiolytic. Uh, or, or is used as an anxiolytic medication. And uh, AC uh, inhibitors, which is the 
antibiotic enzyme used for hypertension to lower the blood pressure. That all of these medications have been used based on the pathophysiology that has been proposed. The pathophysiology of chronic subdural hematoma that involves inflammatory reaction. So um, the uh, uh, corticosteroid will act in a certain uh, level the um, uh, tranic acid, uh, acid, the uh, uh, AC inhibitors, and so forth. Now, the most of these medication that has been studied uh, is uh, steroid. And uh, uh, if we have um, uh, uh, colleagues who are uh, uh, training in Germany, they will, uh, they will tell us if they will uh, uh, interact at the end and tell us about their experience because uh, a big uh, number or a considerable number of centers they use steroids in Germany uh, for the management. So um, we don't uh, use it uh, in Medina region, but we have to have a knowledge that you can utilize it. Maybe it works, maybe not. Till now, we don't have a proof on the adequacy of the medical uh, therapy, but they are just um, um, a um, reports here and there. And when we come to the surgical uh, options, it's not um, uh, it's not a straightforward again. So we find uh, many options. Like, uh, is it a single or uh, uh, two uh, bar holes? Do you put a drain? or you prefer not to put a drain. If you want to put a drain, you put it in the subdural um, uh, space, or will you put it in the subdural space, which we will we'll talk about uh, in a minute. Uh, do you use irrigation? What's the amount of irrigation? What is your end point when you start the irrigation? And uh, now the endoscopic option, has entered in most of the neurosurgical um, uh, procedural techniques uh, and the um, chronic subdural hematoma is not immune to that. So we have many options to consider, but we are looking for the best in each patient. So when we talk about um, uh, in, uh, at the present time, we have many um, uh, articles uh, spoken about the chronic subdural hematoma. And one of the most studied uh, procedure is a single bar hole um, and a closed draining uh, system. Now, the irrigation is whether yes or no, that is not a standardized uh, uh, technique. But like this uh, uh, study review, they found that a small craniotomy, uh, not a, uh, a bar hole, but a small craniotomy with an irrigation and flow system works best for them. Well, we have um, many um, international as well as we also uh, started at one time to use the endoscope for the uh, chronic subdural hematoma as for other neurosurgical diseases. But uh, after a while, uh, personally, I found um, that it did not add on the uh, procedure. Um, maybe it has prolonged, that is, prolonged the time of the procedure and without uh, a specific utilization or benefit from using the uh, endoscope. So, I stopped actually uh, using uh, the uh, endoscope. Now, um, it comes even to the uh, extreme of using urokinase if you have, and you remember the three pictures, we said we have acute, we have chronic, but we have chronic with acute exacerbation. So an acute bleed, which is hyperdense on the CT scan, and then you want also to uh, evacuate that part so it has been advocated to use a uh, bar hole, a uh, drain, and then uh, a urokinase installed for a few uh, days. Um, one of the um, 
um, in my opinion, uh, a good uh, option so that you prevent the uh, potential complication of inserting a subdural uh, train. And I don't know about the number of neurosurgeons in Saudi Arabia who, who use uh, uh, this technique. Maybe we can hear from you. But uh, almost or all, all uh, my cases of chronic subdural hematoma, I don't insert and I don't advocate for putting a subdural uh, drain. On the contrary, once I open the dura uh, and then I put a drain in the subgalial space, just uh, in the subgalial uh, compartment, just above the uh, bar hole and make it to the negative pressure. So it will act as an evacuator for whatever is going to come from the subdural uh, space. Now, I came across this recent uh, article, and it is really a, a, a very sad look at the outcome of um, the different operations, whether single or double drain or drain irrigation, no really, but they found that for the past 20 years, we are not progressing in this simple disease. Why? Maybe because of the diversity. We don't have systematic uh, approach. We don't have a um, eager to be uh, careful in these, what we call between brackets, uh, easy, straightforward, that maybe we don't give much attention to them. Uh, uh, on the contrary, they need a lot of attention. Same as when I talk about the hydrocephalus uh, with the shunt insertion or external ventricular drain. Now, uh, what's the problem after evacuating with whatever uh, you have chosen uh, the surgical techniques is very current. And we have uh, um, uh, now predictors on um, the percentage of the recurrence after the evacuation uh, of the electronic subdural hematoma, like, for example, calculating the volume of the uh, uh, collection before you evacuate it. And the more is the volume, the more is the risk for the um, uh, recurrence. Uh, also, we have some uh, radiological, which is the same as calculating the volume, but here they say if the thickness is more than 20 uh, millimeters, this is an independent predictor, which means that it is a very strong predictor for recurrence. Uh, uh, another uh, study uh, says that the uh, recurrence um, uh, uh, rate is uh, less when you use the subgalial, um, uh, which I just talked about, the subgalial um, uh, drain, uh, low pressure uh, suction. Uh, uh, we have uh, risk factors that uh, talked about uh, dividing them into clinical, radiological, and um, the uh, um, uh, patient factor, like, uh, for example, the age, if the patient has other associated diseases, uh, like um, a seizure or um, a hydrocephalus with a shunt and so forth might increase the, uh, the risk. So we do have a medical therapy for chronic subdural hematoma. We do have a, a surgical, but with um, uh, uh, recurrence. So um, let's go through uh, some of the case uh, scenarios and let's see what other options we can do. So this is uh, a 72, and it shouldn't have appeared like in uh, Mahayar Thomas Hood. Uh, a 79-year-old male, a few days of progressive hemiplegia brought by his uh, sons. They say that he is having increasing instability and becoming um, uh, difficult to be uh, uh, arousable and uh, responsive. And uh, be, uh, uh, one day before uh, bringing him to the hospital, he started not controlling uh, uh, his urine. Um, we asked the family about uh, trauma, so they said or they denied any trauma. 
Anybody would like to discuss uh, this case? Hello, Prof. Muhammad Shardan from Ottawa. Yeah, hello, Sahel. Father Dr. Muhammad. Which level? Which level, Dr. Muhammad? Fifth year. MashaAllah. Ala Washak. Ala Washak, Halas. So we're seeing a plain CT scan and it's showing a left sided mixed density subdural hematoma. It seems like it has a some hyper density in the lower cuts uh, and some septations, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the parietal region. Uh, the denial denial of history of trauma um, is very difficult to to judge based on the family history um, and the. Um, The management of this patient, I would uh, suggest a, uh, a burr hole evacuation of this uh, hematoma. Okay, so um, you decided that this is a chronic subdural hematoma with uh, some uh, septations and a, uh, uh, a little hyperdensity uh, in the occipital uh, area, which might be an acute uh, exacerbation a few days before he arrived and you wanted to evacuate it. So why do you want to evacuate? So the, the patient is uh, symptomatic from it. Uh, he has a uh, increase in stability and uh, hmm. I, I can't see the second word, the uh, in, incontinence, that's what... Uh, yeah, so he, bec he, uh, he became... Right. Uh, unable to control uh, uh, urine. Right. So I, I think those the, 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 those symptoms are, are uh, can be explained by this large uh, subdural hematoma. Um, the acuteness of being unresponsive uh, could be due to a seizure uh, in this case. Um, but nevertheless, I think the best best way to manage this now is to evacuate and observe the patient, see if he, if he has any seizures afterward or anything like that, uh, then I might commit him to a uh, long-term uh, anti-epileptic. Now, also we should um, uh, mention, Dr. Muhammad, that comparing the right to the left, you see almost no uh, guy right sky configuration on the uh, same side. Um, the same goes to the uh, lower level where you have the body of the lateral ventricle on the right side. You don't have it at all on the uh, left side. So I agree with you. This is an uh, acute case that needs to be uh, decompressed. So uh, what's your option here? Uh, um, single or uh, uh, more uh, bar hole? So I've, I've seen... I've, I've seen all the options. Um, the presence of septation could uh, make you think about uh, having two burr holes. Uh, I think going with one burr hole usually is sufficient. And um, uh, I do insert subdural uh, drain, though I saw uh, a good outcome with the subgaleal drain. Uh, I have two of my nine staff, they do subgaleal uh, drains and their, their outcomes are good. We have a couple of questions regarding this case from Dr. Hanan, uh, uh, which I agree with, with her, to be honest. Uh, uh, 79 years old, any history of uh, uh, antiplatelet or anticoagulant in despite of absence of uh, history of trauma? It will uh, change the uh, acuity of management, your prof, or? Yeah, he, uh, he is on uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, baby uh, uh, aspirin, which is uh, 100 milligram uh, uh, daily for the past uh, years. And when he uh, presented to the emergency room also, he, ha he was still uh, uh, receiving this uh, aspirin. So will this change your management? Uh, it wouldn't change my management, uh, Shardad speaking. I, I wouldn't change my management for baby aspirin. Uh, uh, I'll just be more careful when uh, I open the skin. So 
he doesn't track some uh, bleeding from the skin and galia down to the uh, burr hole cavity. And uh, I will make sure that I put a gel foam after I finish. Uh, just be more meticulous with my hemostasis in this case. Montez, so it is the same as even if he, if he wasn't on aspirin. You have to be at al kilma Montaza, you have to be very meticulous. Uh, you should not allow a single drop or RBC to uh, enter. Your aim is to get it out, not to enter a new uh, blood component. So I agree with you. Lacking um, uh, aspirin, uh, or the history of aspirin is important when we talk uh, later. This is one of the predictors of recurrence. Right. So if the patient continued to receive aspirin, then um, uh, uh, we have to be cautious or we might also uh, consider other options that we will talk about uh, in a minute. Montez. So where will you uh, put your bar hole? You, you said a single bar hole, uh, Hatem, where? Um, probably I'll we'll, uh, we'll put it on the thickest part and, and I usually review the coronal images to look at that, but uh, in these axial ones, I would assume the uh, best uh, location of the uh, single bar hole will be over the parietal boss uh, on the left side. Mm. Yeah, so you, you, you know where is the uh, thickest part, which is, for example, here, I will say, how will you apply this to the uh, patient? In other words, uh, how are you going to calculate it? Now, we, you said you want to be very precise. Right, if, if the thickest part is, is really posterior, then that would be very difficult to put your burr hole there in terms of positioning the patient and everything. So I'll choose a, a point that is that is feasible surgically to do it with, without having to pin the patient or uh, having him in a difficult uh, position for anesthesia and respiration. So uh, if it's on the brighter boss, uh, then uh, you, can, you can either measure it from, uh, from the coronal suture and measure uh, exactly with the, uh, on the CT scan, then use your a tape measure in the inside the operating room and go to that area. Uh, that's one way to calculate it. So, yeah, I agree with you. So very important is that you put your measurement and you should know your anatomical land, uh, land uh, mark uh, to refer to. You said one of them is the uh, coronal suture. So. Always, always, uh, I uh, do the marking before I go to the uh, to the uh, operating room. So what I do is I, I bring a, uh, uh, a stapler, it's a regular stapler, bend it and uh, stick it on the uh, patient uh, head where I think is the um, the um, uh, thickest part, as you said, uh, or the one you want to put your per hole. And then I do a single cut on this one. And from there, you can measure. So this is a fixed um, landmark, easy beside the, um, the uh, lesion or the hematoma collection. And you calculate from there. Uh, if you have a stereotactic or a frameless, then uh, it's, it's a um, uh, prestigious yani. Lacking, it's very important to know your uh, anatomical landmark and to know the simple techniques of putting a metal, do a CT scan while you are doing for the, um, uh, for assessing the uh, lesion and then uh, you, you can from there, um, you um, uh, um, measure it one centimeter, half a centimeter, anterior, posterior, and just accordingly. So, in this case, I did uh, two uh, uh, bar holes uh, as uh, was uh, uh, localized here, but then I adjusted it because this was not the highest. So I knew that it is about half a centimeter anterior, but I cannot remember now how many. And then you started to see the gush of the, uh, of the blood from the, uh, from the lower um, uh, uh, bar hole. So I waited slowly. I don't insert the uh, 
section inside, but I, I put it um, on the, on the uh, uh, skull edges of the barhole and uh, allow the hematoma to come. And then I enlarge the dural opening, uh, surmise the drainage, and I start the irrigation. At the end, as I said, I uh, love to put the drain in the subgalial space. So I put in the subgalial crossing both uh, 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 bar holes and lift it for uh, time until it uh, disappears. Now, with these localizers, especially the uh, CT room uh, is not free and the way then you can bring your scalp fill and start calculating. From uh, the uh, the cuts and I used to make these markings on each patient. Take the numbers with me, put it on the uh, table, stick it, and start drawing uh, on the uh, uh, scout CT scan so that we can um, exactly see where we are going to um, put our bar hole to maximize the drainage. Uh, another invention I, I, I did which is uh, a cap with a cap where it the the um, um, Question, Doctor, from the audience regarding the, the, the same case. Uh, one of the question: Would you give uh, dismuprosin before operating on the patient? And uh, what is the flexibility in time uh, if the patient came in midnight with the same presentation? I know. Um, for for me myself, Basim Sheikh, if I saw a patient with a family saying that he was uh, over the last few days, he was. Um, uh, progressive in term of um, symptomatology, uh, uh, he started uh, uh, unable uh, uh, to walk properly and then came to the, uh, to the emergency room, um, uh, cannot uh, walk because of the hemiplegia. Uh, the um, increasing symptomatology uh, made me act fast. So I did not wait till the morning, and we did it. Wallahi, if I can affect احتمال إحداش إثناش المساء يعني فجرا. So uh, bottom line, I don't wait for these if they came uh, 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 progressive like this. Can you wait for another day? Well, maybe, but uh, maybe not also because he's progressing. So, uh, 
Anyone would like to comment on the CT, uh, CTA for this patient? How do you? Yes, so anybody? Let's ask a simpler question. What is this? Aortic arch. So this is the aortic arch. They are sending the aortic arch. Which vessel is this? But this is the brachiocephalic. Yes. Right. And then you see the start of the subclavian where you have the vertebral artery. And you have there, before the subclavian, you have the common oh. carotid artery. Amen? And you have the common carotid artery on the opposite side. So the common carotid divide into? External and internal. External and internal. And how do we know that this is the external and this is the internal? So there is no branch. <laughs> you see, uh, most of the of uh, what we say is how many branches in the internal carotid? The answer is no internal carotid branches in the um, in the uh, neck. But the more precise answer should be most of the time, 95% we don't have branches, but the branches that usually arise from the external carotid, especially the ascending pharyngeal and the occipital artery may take off from the internal carotid artery. And this is not an anomaly, but this is a variation. To cut it short, this patient has on the left side, the left side, an internal carotid artery stenosis. So we should have noted this uh, before we propose for him any endovascular mean of management. This is a uh, less than 50% in an asymptomatic patient, so we don't uh, usually manage uh, surgical or endovascular. Now, the procedure is simple for chronic subdural hematoma, whether bar hole, single, double, drain, no drain, uh, very simple. Uh, if the patient is cooperative, we usually do it under uh, local uh, anesthesia, especially in these elderly. Uh, but if it was not done properly, then you are asking for uh, complication. And I have seen uh, many of these complications by people who uh, were not um, keen to pay some time for this patient. And severe uh, air trapped, so instead of making a decompression, they replaced the collection by air. Not even that, but what is, what is operative and uh, CT scan, this was noted. So this is a cerebral uh, contusion by the brain. This is another uh, one, you see the uh, which was supposed to be epidural, yeah, which was supposed to be a subdural, is now in the uh, parenchyma with a lot of air traps uh, in, and so on and so forth. So the uh, messages, we have to be real uh, uh, careful and pay attention to the surgical steps uh, and maneuvers that we put, especially neurosurgeons should have very delicate uh, and smooth hands on uh, wounds and brains. Now, when we, um, uh, when we talk about chronic subdural hematoma, I lately uh, got re-interested in it, uh, and this is by introducing the endovascular management for, for the chronic subdural hematoma. There have been several uh, uh, reports uh, in the past few years um, claiming the uh, benefit of, of uh, embolization of the middle meningeal artery. Why the middle meningeal artery? Why the middle meningeal artery is the enemy in chronic subdural hematoma? Why do you, uh, what do you think? Um, 
the dura is mainly supplied by the middle meningeal artery, whether the anterior, the frontal, parietal, or the posterior uh, meningeal uh, artery. So the middle meningeal artery is the uh, main source of supply for, if you remember the three, uh, three layers, the periosteal, the meningeal, and the, the inner muscle. Uh, so the interest for the endovascular uh, neurosurgeons to embolize the MMA, which supplies this area, cut off the uh, supply to the small capillaries that will usually um, uh, lead to a progression in the uh, uh, bleeding accumulation, more uh, pressure from the chronic subdural hematoma. So this is a case. Uh, I think it's by mistake. And this is a 60 five-year-old uh, Saudi gentleman who presented with a um, big, uh, he himself says that I have no disturbance. But then digging into the uh, questioning him, he said that uh, when I start, uh, uh, I want to walk, I'm not steady as uh, before. Clinical examination, he does not have any um, uh, uh, no weakness, no uh, uh, cranial nerves, or builder uh, uh, sign. Uh, so, any um, volunteer to describe? Hello, assalamu alaikum. Yeah, hello, assalamu alaikum. Allah. Ahmed bin Ali, Asir uh, Central Hospital. Uh, can you hear me now, Dr. Basim? Yes, we can hear you now. Uh, start with the description of the. <laughs> Yes, the image on the left side is an MRI representing a hyperintensity occupying the frontoparietal region of the left side. And the images below this hyperintensity is going to more hypointense. And uh, it's uh, actually uh, even revealing a significant infacement and loss of configuration of the sulci and the gyi. On the CT scan, on the right side, it's showing also a hypodense entity occupying the same area, frontal uh, parietal area on the left side. And also it is representing loss of configuration of the sulci and gyri in comparison to the right side. With actually seen in the image below, and uh, an obliteration of the uh, posterior horn of the lateral ventricle in the MRI. And these images, the one above is representing a T2 image and the one below representing a T1 image. And the CT and is so a non-contrast so CT. It is hyper intense both. It's hyper intense both, T2 and yeah. T1. Yes, hyperintense in both So what will you do for this page? Um, I can probably, maybe Dr. Basim, if you allow me, I can, maybe in this patient, we can consider uh, a surgical option, considering the loss of configuration and the obliteration of the posterior horn as well, and the uh, unsteadiness can also advocate as well for a surgical uh, procedure. Surgical, you mean what? Uh, uh, surgical, uh, as, as we mentioned before in the case previous, a uh, bar hole evacuation. Okay, so I, I agree with you. I mean, um, we do have a significant pressure um, I offer the patient both uh, options of the endovascular and the, and the surgical uh, evacuation by birth uh, I was leaning toward the endovascular because of the um, uh, presentation is not of that acute as was the previous uh, example which I uh, presented before. And that's why we took him for surgery. Uh, we did the embolization this is before the embolization, and this is five weeks after, before and five weeks after. Um, 
سامعني دكتور احمد؟ معك بروفيسور صوت ممتاز. طيب So this is what we did. We went through the uh, uh, radiant approach, which is uh, my preferred uh, uh, route, and not the femoral. So we transradial uh, under ultrasound, and we went through the radial, the uh, uh, brachial, until we reached the arch, and then we reached what is this artery? This is a super selective with a microcatheter in the middle meningeal artery, and it's showing you the branches of the middle meningeal artery selectively. And as I suggest, I think we should have a special um, uh, sessions, and not only one session, on the angioarchitecture of the cerebrovascular um, uh, arteries, starting from the arch and great bristles until we reach for the uh, small. Hena, I will, excellent. So this is the uh, arterial sheath, uh, which is in the radial artery, and then we make the initial injection. You see the radial, and then coming through the ulnar and the uh, palmar arch, which indicate a very good circulation in the hand. Uh, and then we went for the um, uh, angio, titanal angio and Yes. Yes. أرجع مرة ثانية من البداية إنه this is the radial injection showing the radial, the ulnar artery and the palmar arch. واضحة أنا بينهم. Yes. And then we uh, we went with the uh, with the catheter until we came to the aortic arch and we made an injection, so I will show you, and I will show you that the one which we saw uh, previously in the CT angio, the ascending aorta, the aortic arch, and then you will have the descending aorta later. So where is the catheter now? The catheter is in the brachiocephalic artery, and you have the left inter uh, the left common carotid artery, and then the left subclavian, so this will make, which artery is this? This is the vertebral artery. Vertebral artery, and then you have the common carotid is bifurcating. So now we will go for a selective injection of the common carotid artery. I have done the arch aortogram. And now you see that this is the common carotid, the catheter is inside, and this is called Simon catheter, and you can see the injection is showing the internal carotid going to the brain and the external carotid with the branches. And what is the first branch posteriorly that comes from the external carotid? The first one is the occipital artery that will go posteriorly. Right. So once we are there, then we will engage the catheter into the, uh, the external carotid artery and start looking at where is the origin of the where is the origin or the middle meningeal artery will arise from where. So this is a selective external carotid injection, oblique somewhat, is showing the external carotid artery and the final bifurcation of the external carotid will be into the one which supply the skin and the scalp. The, the external carotid will end into two main divisions. Yes. This is the first one, and this is the second one. So the first one is the superficial temporal artery. صحيح? And the second one, which we want to see, is the internal maxillary artery that will give rise to the middle meningeal artery. So if you can see the microcatheter is inside that area, and we now we catheterize 
the middle meningeal artery and did our run and we use that run as as what we call roadmap roadmap is uh, it means that we use it and then we follow the catheter on that um, uh, uh, image at the end this is what we did is the injection of the middle meningeal artery branches at the area if you remember that the hematoma was mainly parieto occipital so we obliterated all the branches and the uh, small branches that coming from the uh, middle meningeal artery by use of a liquid embolic material which is of many uh, companies now one of them is onyx we do have another one called fill or a third one which is the uh, uh, squid so so now we we did two examples one that we really said we can and we need to know and master the uh, microsurgical or here it's not micro but it's a surgical evacuation of the hematoma by barhol different technique we have to be careful and to avoid any complication and the same thing goes for the endovascular so chronic subdural hematoma you can uh, make the uh, management for it simple save the patient uh, 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 will go satisfied and you will be satisfied by putting a systemic approach that will reach safely to the end of the management of the patient. Jazakum Allah khairi dafi andakum asila. I will start with a, a question, uh, Prof. I know the ideal for chronic subdural hematoma is bear hole evacuation, either a single or multiple uh, bear hole. But uh, I, I, saw, I saw many cases uh, during the residency. Uh, most of them in post-op image, we don't have uh, a sufficient or, a, a, or actually a complete evacuation of subdural uh, hematoma. There is small residual remaining, uh, despite we put a drain or not. Uh, what about small mini craniotomy for chronic subdural hematoma? I know it's not ideal in textbook, but it will give you a wider op uh, opening for uh, better uh, evacuation, less uh, pneumocephalus, uh, uh, better visualization for uh, intradural drain, if you will put an intradural drain. What do you think, Prof? Yeah, so um, um, avoiding a uh, disaster is not by uh, shifting from the highway. Uh, but avoiding disaster is by taking uh, note of what can you uh, change uh, in your method, what can you change in your uh, technique to make it uh, safe. Now, um, many, when you say mini craniotomy, it's not a big uh, uh, thing and you can, you can do it. But why should I jump to that if I can do it with a, uh, a bird home? Now, uh, you said putting a subdural drain. I don't put for years now, I don't put a subdural or the drain in the subdural compartment and I always, always put it in the um, uh, subgalian uh, uh, area and it is a very satisfactory uh, outcome. Now, post-operative, we don't treat the image, but we treat the patient. Uh, if you have a small uh, re residual, uh, almost always we don't uh, uh, interfere. We don't go after to evacuate that residual. And most of the patient will go on not to have treatment. And I'm talking about 70% uh, of the patient. Now, some are at high risk of recurrence, and we agree that those are the patients who we do advocate, if you need it, evacuation to be followed by the endovascular uh, method. And the endovascular is to prevent mm -hmm. the ongoing process of um, um, uh, leaking from the uh, uh, most inner part of the dura, which is the uh, dura cell zone. Uh, 
بروف اذا تسمح لي في كابل اوف كويشن ريجاردنج النيموسيفلس ذا فيرست وان هاو تو افويد ات اند ذا اذر كويشن از وات از ذا ريسك فاكتور تو ديفلوب تنشن نيموسيفلس اند هاو وي افويد ات So um, uh, air will always go high, isn't it? So air will always go up, will not go down. So uh, when you evacuate a hematoma, always, always try to uh, wash, keep the head of the patient higher, move the head of the patient smoothly and slowly from right to left, flexion, a little bit extension, and this is very slowly, and irrigate it with uh, saline. This will prevent the accumulation of air or even trapping sometimes, because if you evacuate suddenly and then air goes there and the brain will re-expand like this, so it might obstruct the exit area. So the air will, will be in trap, and then you call the tension pneumocephalus. So prevention is always better than uh, cure. Okay. I have another question. In, in, in which subdural uh, hematoma cases you would consider endoscopic cauterization is an advantage in uh, comparison to birth hall or evacuation? Yeah, as I mentioned in the beginning, I used to apply an endoscopic evacuation. If any of the seniors um, uh, is with us and they are using the endoscope, they can share with, with us. But for um, the past uh, period, I stopped utilizing the endoscope uh, for the uh, chronic subdural hematoma because personally, I did not find any advantage. For example, one of the advantages in the literature says that it will be safer to control any bleeding from a bridging vein uh, once it, uh, uh, it occurs. Well, my answer is you should not have a bridging vein tear while you are evacuating a chronic subdural hematoma. May it be done, Dr. Ahmed. We have a question. Uh, Uh, I, uh, but I think you, you answer it. What is the interest of immediate post-op images if the patient is clinically satisfactory? I, I, I think you uh, uh, mentioned the answer in the previous comment. Uh, uh, yeah, one thing that you asked me is um, I personally prefer to have a baseline. So number one, patient is evacuated. Number two, Even if the patient is doing fine, you should have a baseline before the individual is discharged uh, home. Because if he came back, and this applies also for hydrocephalus, if you put a shunt, you want to know the baseline before he goes home. If he returned back with any new thing, you should know, was it before present, or this is a real new thing that has appeared. Uh, we have a question about the uh, blephix and aspirin. If the patient on blephix uh, or aspirin preoperatively, what time you resume the uh, medication in postoperative uh, period? Yeah. Um, if we are talking about the uh, surgical evacuation uh, and the uh, patient is a need for the uh, for the aspirin i don't stop it uh, i keep the patient on the uh, on the aspirin especially if he came in an emergency like our first example he was on aspirin so we resume the aspirin once we um, um, we are done with the procedure uh, if the patient is going for the endovascular uh, embolization then on the contrary we want him Uh, to be on uh, uh, on aspirin. Uh, the uh, Plavix is another thing. Now we should know that uh, patients on Plavix are in need to prevent any intra uh, uh, intravascular thrombosis, especially if they are on uh, stent. So if the patient is um, having a cranial 
for a cardiac stent, you should not stop the uh, flavix. And then we should weigh the, uh, uh, the uh, risk benefit. The first patient needed an immediate intervention. So I will prepare all the uh, required uh, uh, maneuvers like fresh frozen plasma, uh, uh, platelets, uh, and uh, do it as safe as we always uh, do, very precise, no bleeding, very slow, uh, and uh, stop the uh, plavix from the time you are uh, going for surgery, and then resume it uh, after five days or when the uh, drain is removed, because you don't want to remove the drain, make some friction, bleeding while the patient is on plavix. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of questions about the pneumocephalus, so I would try to uh, just make them in one question. Uh, initially, uh, what is the uh, your management in patient with uh, massive pneumocephalus? And the other part of the question, does the head position post-operatively uh, matter in a case of preventing the hydrocephalus, like a head elevating and flat uh, bed? Tamam. So num number one is the uh, pneumocephalus, and then pneumocephalus uh, depends on the patient condition. If the patient is stable, even if it is large, uh, then you will uh, apply uh, pure uh, oxygen for one day and uh, check again. Most of the time, the oxygen replaces the nitrogen in the free uh, air, and then it will uh, resolve. Now, if it was causing a real significant uh, uh, pressure, then I had it once. Uh, the patient had a craniotomy, and then after that, attention and uh, pneumocephaly, which needed uh, removal of the uh, uh, of the uh, craniotomy and opening the dura again and the air pop out. Uh, but most of the time, only uh, pure oxygen uh, for one day. The uh, second part is the position uh, post-operatively. Well, um, uh, classically, you should have the patient head down. Uh, realistically, uh, these um, uh, patients are uh, old enough not to agree on whatever you advise them uh, for. And then you have to weigh the thing. The last patient, this which I told you, 79, and sometimes the, uh, the, um, the family were fighting with him, trying to keep him in bed, head down. So my decision was we should not do that because uh, making him strain might be more harmful than beneficial. So yes, Classically, you should have the patient down until the drain uh, is out without any uh, residual hematoma coming out. But um, uh, in real life, it is not possible. Always. Uh, Prof, we have a couple of questions about bilateral uh, subdural uh, hematoma. The first one is the rule of endovascular choice in case of subdural and bilateral subdural hematoma. And the second one is, uh, uh, what's your recommendation regarding uh, bear hole? What should we start first? Or do you do both in the same sitting? And for uh, bilateral uh, hematoma, I did not come across um, until now um, for the uh, endovascular option. But I guess that if I was uh, faced with a, a case tomorrow, my decision would be the same. Um, if it is indicated, if the patient is not uh, in emergency for immediate evacuation, then we can do it for both sides at the same time through the same uh, uh, approach, which is radial. Uh, you can do the right side and the left side. And uh, on the contrary, when you are doing the uh, bar hole, I, am, I personally, I prefer to do skin incision on both sides and then the bar hole on both sides, and then simultaneously two persons top 
the Bureau at the same time. Is this necessarily or not? Uh, actually, I cannot tell you, but this is my plan. I put them at the same time. Uh, we have a question here about the newly published double crescent sign. Have you seen it in our uh, uh, population and uh, is it really significant? Yeah, yeah. and this is what I um, mentioned in the beginning that it indicates on the CT and MRI, I will bring the image again. Yeah, so this is the double crescent sign that it proposed that it is a subdural uh, uh, hygroma or uh, a, sub, uh, a subdural uh, hematoma. And that is the layer of the dura being hyperdense. So you have the epidural, the dura, and then the subdural space. I, I, uh, well, I, I did not look for it uh, actually. Uh, in the images, but maybe if we look, we can see more. Okay. Uh, we have a, uh, we will conclude with this question because uh, we have a lot of questions and I'm sorry if I miss your question, guys. Uh, is transemic acid used in Saudi Arabia? And what about a new experimental therapy like dexamethasone and statin for conservative management? Yeah. We cannot call uh, uh, steroid as uh, experimental because as I uh, said, in some parts uh, or centers, uh, I know them personally that they do all chronic subdural hematomas. Uh, they start them immediately on uh, oral uh, uh, steroids. So it is um, uh, being uh, used. Uh, tranexamic acid, yes, it is used in Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, we use it in uh, National Guard in Medina, uh, but not for chronic subdural hematoma. Uh, if you are mentioning the use of tranexamic acid, yes, we use it uh, uh, whether in uh, trauma or uh, if you have an intraoperative uh, uh, bleeding, especially with meningioma, um, Multiple reports have the benefit of utilizing tranexamic acid to decrease the amount of, um, uh, of blood loss, especially in meningioma resection. Allah <laughs>